Good morning and good time of the day, everyone who is able to join us and to see us. Today we discuss with the partners as Razum we stand and um, uh, embargo on Russian oil and um, its first results for further steps uh, which are needed to limit income of a crescent state and to end the war against Ukraine. Um, today we have a few speakers, which I would like to introduce you gladly. The first one is Lori Moliverta, who is lead analyst from the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air. He will be sharing the presentation on the latest results and research on how the first months of oil embargo went in general. Um, and the second speaker would be Oleg Ustenko, Chief Economic Advisor to President Zelensky, Maya Rosner, Campaigner at Global Witness, and Oleg Savitsky, Campaign Manager of Razum We Stand. So um, it's the structure of this press briefing would be as follows. The first one we will be able to see and hear the presentation of Lori Molivirta, as we said, and then we'll have a short discussion where each speaker would be presenting during five minutes uh, their points and their analysis of what's been done and is the embargo effective on oil and what steps are needed. And then you will have a chance to ask questions. Uh, if you joined us and you have some questions, just please push, type them in the chat or raise your hand to ask them in voice. So I think we can start, and the floor goes to Lori Molivirta, elite analyst for CREA. Lori, up to you. Uh, thank you, Svetlana, and uh, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, so it's been um, a bit more than a month since uh, the EU um, ban on, on crude oil imports um, came into force. Um, and uh, uh, it's really important to remember that this is the first significant step that uh, um, the EU has taken um, to sanction um, Russian um, oil or gas. Um, we've been talking about it for a long time, but this is the first time that a real significant step was taken. And the expectations about the impact of uh, this ban Rates very widely. There were people saying that it will be very easy for Russia to to sell to other countries. It won't have much of an impact, um, or it might uh, um, cause big big trouble for uh, the EU in terms of uh, or the global market in terms of oil prices or supplies and so on. Um, and and now now we can really start to see uh, what the reality is. Um, the other. Um, other thing that entered into force is, is the price cap, which uh, um, was uh, which, is, which is a really new novel uh, mechanism and uh, being implemented and tested uh, for the first time. Um, the good news um, is that uh, there has been a very clear um, impact on, on Russia's revenues um, over the past month. Um, so we estimate that uh, um, bef uh, in uh, in the uh, three months before the ban, Russia was making an average of uh, uh, 600 million euros per day um, out of uh, uh, fossil fuel exports. And uh, that has fallen by 160 million um, euros per day um, because of the ban. Um, so a very significant impact and even more significant in terms of uh, tax revenue because oil is really where um, uh, Kremlin makes most of its uh, uh, fiscal um, income. You can see the drop in the value of uh, crude oil exports um, um, here in the in the graph and uh, um, the impact that it had on the value of the total exports. You can also see that uh, there has been an increase in oil products, which are still allowed in uh, um, uh, into Europe for now. So that offsets some of the impact we estimate about that Russia managed to increase oil products exports by about 20 million euros per day to offset some of the ban. Um, and uh, uh, the third thing that happened is that uh, um, Germany stopped importing um, oil uh, through the uh, Ruzba pipeline um, at the end of the year. And uh, we estimate that that cost about 20 million euros um, uh, 
per day to Russia. So the outcome of all of those things is, is uh, um, a loss of about uh, 160 million euros per day. But that leaves us, us in a situation where Russia is still making more than um, 600 uh, uh, million um, euros per day. Um, from oil exports, you can see that that's uh, for the EU. Um, the EU is now um, sending much less money um, to uh, to Russia than it, it did um, before the start of the full-scale invasion. But uh, for Russia's overall revenue, it's still above um, or at the same level as it was in uh, December uh, the year before. Um, so um, and will will fall to um, to the uh, level level in the previous um, months. So there is still a long way to go. Um, looking at who is now importing, um, the EU has also reduced LNG imports because uh, the supply situation is better. So in December, Japan became the largest importer of LNG um, from Russia. Uh, with the EU falling, um, China hasn't been importing much recently. In terms of pipeline gas, the EU remains the largest importer this, despite all the reductions that have taken place, uh, followed by um, uh, Turkey and uh, China. And because of oil product imports and pipeline imports, the EU still uh, remained the largest importer of, of uh, um, uh, oil. Um, from from Russia in December. This is going to change um, once uh, in in January, February, when when new steps are taken. Um, so how do we go about uh, um, reducing uh, Russia's revenue um, further? Um, the uh, most obvious option is uh, when the when the crude oil price cap was agreed. Um, the agreement was that the price cap would be revised in mid-January. So um, those countries, uh, Poland and Baltic countries that really wanted a strong price cap from the beginning, made a compromise that uh, they will agree to $60 per bar barrel, but uh, it's going to be um, revised uh, um, and adjusted in uh, mid-January. And uh, the key thing to understand is that uh, at $60 a barrel, uh, we did a, an analysis of, of Russia's uh, budgetary revenues in 2021. At $60 a barrel, Kremlin collects about, about three-fourths of, of that price in tax, with only one-fourth going to the producers, um, so an average of $15 uh, per barrel. Um, so there, And these taxes are adjusted every month, so they're not fixed. Um, so. Um, and that means that there's a lot of room um, to uh, uh, lower the price cap without making oil production in, in Russia so unprofitable that it would uh, disrupt supply. And so um, we estimate that by uh, by cutting, uh, revising the price cap from um, $60 to $30, um, Russia's revenues can be reduced by a further um, 100 million um, euros per day. So this is uh, um, uh, this is the big um, big picture of what's happened uh, um, uh, from uh, from late last year until the current situation. Um, as I said, a reduction of uh, uh, 160 million euros. Um, uh, the uh, ban on oil product imports into Europe will enter, enter into force in February. That will have a further impact, and there will be a price cap on oil products that will have a further impact. And uh, Poland, Poland's Orlen will cut uh, imports. Those things will have a further impact that will further um, cut revenue to Russia by, by 120 million euros per day as an, as an estimate. And uh, we've identified further measures, um, most importantly, revising the price cap, but also um, addressing pipeline gas and LNG imports to Russia that could ac accomplish a further reduction of uh, 200 uh, 
a million euros. So th this is uh, the key message that uh, um, the EU and, and Ukraine's other allies still have a lot of options, a lot of steps that they can take. Um, the crude oil ban definitely wasn't the end of it. The other thing that uh, is really important, so when we've uh, um, assess the impact uh, um, of the price gap. We're um, only um, assuming that it uh, that uh, the lower price applies to those um, ships that are insured or owned in Europe, um, where where um, the price gap. Uh, and so, so first of all, you can see that the Urals um, crude oil, which is the most um, important variety sold by Russia um, uh, has been falling in price very dramatically. Um, so that's where the oil, uh, price gap has been working and that's where the losses uh, to Russia have occurred. Um, what hasn't been, uh, where it hasn't been working is in the Pacific. So uh, Russia is still managing, according to reported price benchmarks, to sell oil uh, to China uh, through its far eastern uh, ports at, at prices that are above um, uh, the, the price gap. Um, and uh, um, this is something that requires clarification, first of all, because we are seeing tankers um, insured in, in the UK um, that are carrying this oil in the Far East. Um, so um, most the most likely explanation for this is that uh, um, the buyers of that oil, either in China or traders elsewhere, are signing papers saying that, no, no, we didn't pay more than the price gap. Um, and uh, then they give that paper uh, to the insurer and the insurer says we're complying uh, with everything. This is a, the, the way that the price gap is, is being enforced is a very soft measure. Um, and uh, um, we would definitely argue that the fact that the published uh, price benchmarks are above um, um, above the price gap. Um, mean that uh, um, that uh, uh, the insurers shouldn't believe um, these attestations, and they can't, in good faith, claim that uh, uh, that they are complying. But also, it means that the the penalties uh, for violating the price gap policy um, and they are uh, um, they are. Uh, requirements for disclosure um, need to be um, uh, strengthened. Another thing um, uh, out of this is that the share of uh, of tankers that are owned by Russia or China or untraceable third parties has, has increased in this specific uh, trade. Um, so it's very, very important to take further steps or, or to take steps to prevent, prevent uh, um, oil tankers from being sold uh, to these untraceable um, third parties. And, and we discussed those in the briefing that we've uh, um, released um, today. So uh, the um, recommendations from us, um, first of all, uh, one thing that's important to, to remember is that uh, uh, the oil ban, um, the other steps that have been taken, um, to, to reduce imports from Russia um, have been um, successful and manageable because there have been reductions in fossil fuel consumption um, in Europe. And uh, the efforts to, um, to promote those uh, reductions through energy savings, energy efficiency, clean energy efforts um, should be intensified. Um, the lower the, um, the uh, price is, the less, less, less we need to import um, overall, the easier it is to take these steps. Um, the uh, price cap should be revised down um, significantly to a level that really um, starts to squeeze out uh, um, the taxable profits um, that uh, that uh, Russian oil producers um, are making. Um, um, as, I, as I just said, um, the uh, implementation of uh, the price cap mechanism needs to be strengthened um, in multiple ways. Um, there need to be additional restrictions or sanctions uh, to limit the sales of tankers to untraceable buyers. And uh, we need uh, either restrictions, bans, or, um, or a, um, a price cap on the imports of pipeline gas and LNG um, 
uh, from Russia um, to the EU. The most obvious place to start is uh, Poland that is already saying that it wants to stop importing, but it can't um, get out of existing um, contracts without, without an EU decision um, to ban um, pipeline crude oil. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Laurie. And for those who joined us a bit later, uh, we are at a press briefing on the first months of embargo and price cap on Russian oil and further steps that are needed to limit income of Russia as a terrorist state. And my name is Svetlana Romanko. I am director of Razum. We stand one of the partners who organize this press briefing today for us. And uh, uh, please, if you have some questions, po post them in the chat. We will have a chance to ask them later after the discussion ends. And now the floor goes to our experts present with us. Thank you so much for finding your time to join us. Ole Hustenko, Chief Economic Advisor to President Zelensky, our big powerful voice on embargo and uh, stop ending Russian fossil fuel war. Uh, to you, Oleg Leonidovich. Thank you very much, Svetlana. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot uh, uh, for organizing this event and uh, many thanks to Lori and his team for uh, doing this really uh, terrific, if I may say, assessment of our uh, assessment of results. Uh, after uh, uh, they were introduced, all these measures uh, uh, on Russian uh, oil. I would say that now everything is uh, very clear for everybody, even for those who were uh, quite pessimistic about uh, these uh, steps which were undertaken uh, before uh, December 5th all these negotiations, all these consultations, eventually we show that the system is really uh, workable. Uh, now we, everything is uh, connected into one picture. Uh, the uh, world uh, still continues to have oil. Uh, supply of oil is ongoing. Uh, Russians are uh, uh, losing their revenues which is also a very good news. Uh, so the initial purpose was to supply the world with the oil, but at the same time, uh, to make sure that Russians do not have enough hands uh, in order to continue this uh, terrible uh, aggression against us. So this task uh, is under control now. I would agree with Lori and with uh, the uh, conclusion made uh, by his team is that it's definitely not enough. Uh, I would say that yes, uh, each escalation uh, should uh, require from our side you know, further actions in order uh, to uh, squeeze uh, the price gap even further. And yes, uh, our position from the very beginning in here was very much clear, uh, we, and, and actually it was uh, also articulated by the president of the country. Uh, so the produ marginal production cost, uh, this is the goal, not more than that. And we believe in here that marginal production cost uh, is around, I would say between 20 to $30. So that's why uh, we wouldn't mind to see this price level as soon as possible. And one more time, each escalation uh, should, uh, should, 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 should be translated into that kind of uh, downward uh, in uh, Russian, uh, in, in price cap Russian oil. Uh, yes, uh, they were needed uh, to have in their hands around one uh, billion euros daily uh, to do this aggression against us. Now it's substantially lower, but still, you know, still they have enough, uh, enough uh, cash in their hands. That's why we have to go even further. That's why everything related to oil products is extremely important. And we uh, do uh, believe that it's uh, going to be uh, very powerful 
very powerful measure uh, which will limit uh, Russian budget revenues even further. Uh, we do believe that this time it's going to uh, go much, I would say, not easier, but very straightforward because we already have experience with oil. So uh, no, no, no reasons uh, to wait and see, to keep this on consultations. Everything is already clear. So we will divide uh, oil products by several groups. And then starting from there, we will introduce uh, these uh, price uh, caps for oil products as well. Uh, do we really do enough? Uh, of course not. Uh, we need uh, uh, to do more. And that's why everything related to nuclear energy and fossil fuel uh, in general uh, should be uh, under our control. Uh, I'm grateful to Lori that he mentioned at the beginning that uh, despite all these you know, immediate goals uh, we are trying uh, to reach now. There is also a strategic goal, and the strategic goal is uh, a, a serious shift uh, towards uh, green technology, saving uh, energy technologies. All these uh, tasks or goals we were arguing for decades, probably already. So, and this is also uh, an important uh, issue. So, as exactly as uh, uh, in the name of uh, Svetlana Romanko institution organization, rather than stand, yes, rather than stand, and we can do tremendous amount of uh, good things and eventually uh, to get uh, this victory uh, to all of us, to people of Ukraine. Uh, to uh, the whole world uh, who is standing with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Oleg Leonidovich. It was great to have you with us, and thank you for your hard work uh, with the presidential administration and office and with the president itself for supporting the campaign and the demands so boldly. And um, now I would like to invite my Rosner, our long-term partner we're from uh, Global Witness as well, to uh, discuss her point of, of view on the sanctions and the first months. Thank you so much, Svetlana, and thank you, uh, Kriya, for this wonderful uh, report. It's a reminder to me that, you know, while governments are responsible for creating these rules and for setting up uh, the rules and restrictions around trade, it has so often fallen to NGOs and think tanks like Kriya and like Global Witness to actually monitor their effectiveness and to point out the loopholes. Um, and in the context of the price cap, this is really important and it speaks to some of the policy recommendations that Lowry made about the need for more stringent transparency and reporting standards around the price cap, uh, prohibiting kind, certain kinds of tanker sales and increasing penalties for violations of the price cap. You know, all of these recommendations fall into a bucket that I would uh, kind of categorize as enforcement. Um, and enforcement is going to be really crucial in these next phases. You know, now we have the price kept in place, but enforcement is the muscle that makes it effective. And what we found uh, both with the import embargoes and also with the price cap is that after months of diplomacy and negotiations and resources that go into making the rules themselves, uh, very little is invested in actually enforcing them. Um, that's particularly true in the EU. You know, when I met with FISMA, uh, the EU body that's responsible for, for sanctions oversight, they informed me that they had about 24 people overseeing some 40 sanctions regimes. So a real critical lack of staffing to be able to manage uh, you know, just sanctions on Russia. This was, you know, covering sanctions across the entire world. Um, and with the price cap, uh, this is even more critical, more investment in enforcement, because the price cap, uh, as Laurie pointed out, um, 
relies on self-reporting by companies by, between private actors that they are in fact trading below uh, the set level um, and allowing these private actors just to self-report and to you know not be subject to audit is effectively allowing them to grade their own homework uh, which you know we can't rely on private companies that stand to benefit and stand to profit from this trade to uh, just we can't just rely on their goodwill to uphold the price cap um, you know at global witness a lot of what we do revolves around investigating that gap between what fossil fuel companies say and what they actually do, and particularly in the context of uh, Russia and the war in Ukraine, um, we found that you know their actions deviate often um, greatly from their words, uh, you know, which are often very supportive of Ukraine and, and very, um, you know, uh, saying how much they condemn the war and condemn Russia, but at the same time, they still continue to profit from this trade. So, you know, we know that if traders stand to make millions from cargoes of Russian oil sold above the price cap, and if they, the traders, know that the attestation process is not closely monitored uh, and that the penalties for violation are extremely low and it won't cost them financially, that, that, you know, those are risks that they will be willing to take. So um, I just really want to emphasize that we've arrived at this place where we have these rules agreed upon. Um, and it's really important now that we hold companies accountable. And as Lowry pointed out, that we increase the penalties for violations, that we don't allow Western companies like UK insurers to continue facilitating this deadly trade, um, and that we make uh, bring more transparency and, and accountability to the reporting process. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Mai. And um, uh, I am monitoring the questions where we'll be having the chance to ask them after Oleg, uh, after our Oleg Savitsky, campaign manager for Us and We Stand, will speak to you, Oleg. Uh, thanks, Svetlana. I would like to add uh, some uh, more emphasis on environmental aspects of uh, what what is happening with with Russian oil currently. So uh, as EU ports uh, uh, have closed uh, for uh, Russian oil, uh, it now uh, is is attempted to uh, to be uh, shipped to uh, much. Uh, more remote destinations uh, like uh, India, uh, African countries, and uh, uh, the, the the Russian Ural spoil, uh, which was uh, by the, uh, which was purchased by uh, EU uh, companies in in large amounts, uh, is now uh, uh, instead of uh, a week or a few days, is traveling. Um, a month uh, or more uh, through the ocean, uh, and uh, uh, those ships they uh, don't have uh, uh, proper insurance. They are insured inside Russia or in in some African countries or somewhere else where where actually this this insurance doesn't uh, 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 cover will, will not cover the losses and will not cover the damage if uh, the oil spill occurs. Uh, and this is a real danger because uh, those uh, uh, oil ships, they are uh, 10, 15 or uh, more years old because uh, Russia and uh, the associated traders, they buy secondhand tankers. And uh, th this issue uh, has to be raised internationally and uh, also that there is uh, additional risk of spills associated with transshipment of Russian oil. Uh, and this occurs in, in huge amounts uh, near the shores of Greece, where uh, uh, oil from uh, Black Sea uh, uh, at those uh, like uh, depreciated old vessels uh, uh, from Russian ports uh, is transshipped uh, to larger tankers. 
uh, and the, the transshipment process itself is risky and the the uh, the Russian uh, old uh, vessels are risky and uh, the, this uh, issue has to be raised um, and um, there should be measures uh, to uh, limit or prohibit uh, uh, transshipment of uh, Russian oil uh, and also uh, the, the price cap coalition countries uh, they should uh, ban uh, the the Russian tankers which don't follow uh, or Russian or other countries the countries that buy uh, oil uh, without uh, uh, matching the price cap and following the uh, the price cap coalition rules uh, those ships uh, should be banned from uh, territorial waters of uh, price cap coalition countries that that would be a, a real uh, enforcement uh, and uh, and a real uh, show of strength of uh, international community against Russia, and this uh, has to happen. Uh, and we don't uh, have to wait for another escalation. And uh, there, there should be a, a definitely uh, ongoing process between Ukraine and EU between uh all the our uh uh allies uh, to make uh, the oil sanctions really deadly for russia yes thank you so much Alek. and we have a few questions and we will be sending the recording to the journalists who registered for the event as well so the first question is to laurie um because uh, on the facebook i just noticed there were a few comments on um first of all on natural gas um do you still envision the strong embargo on uh, russian natural gas happening and what were the numbers on Russian gas exports from uh, natural uh, gas exports from Russia and how we could probably impose more stricter sanctions on gas as well. Thanks. Uh, thank you. As you could see in my, my slides, the volume of, uh, uh, of uh, fossil gas imports from Russia has dropped uh, uh, dramatically uh, from the start of the year to um, up to around 20 to 25 percent of what uh, Europe was importing um, uh, before um, uh, the the start of the war. Um, so in that on that in that sense, it might look like there's been a lot of progress. But because Russia has manipulated the price of uh, of gas by by cutting down supplies, the revenue that they're making is still similar to what they were making before um, uh, they they started. Uh, um, cutting back supplies. So, so uh, my starting point is simply that this is uh, a perverse situation that uh, Russia is being is manipulating the market, is withholding supplies, and is being rewarded for it uh, with uh, by getting as much money for their gas exports to Europe as they used to. Um, so there needs to be a solution for this. Um, the reason why this happens is that uh, um, the prices paid to Russia for gas are linked um, to the um, wholesale gas prices in the internal European market, um, the what's called the, the TTF um, exchange. Um, and uh, so one way or the other, um, uh, if we don't completely ban um, the imports of um, um, gas from Russia, uh, one way or the other, uh, these prices need to be um, uh, decoupled. Um, so one way of doing that would be an import tariff um, on uh, on the, that would depress the TTF price, and then uh, um, um, uh, then uh, having non-Russian gas traded in a new system. Um, that is not uh, um, uh, not the, the TTF. Um, um, or or a price cap um, uh, on uh, um, on on Russian gas, um, uh, but but in, in one way or the other, um, the uh, the prices for Russian gas and and uh, have to be decoupled from the internal um, market. Of course, we should move as quickly as possible to uh, completely eliminate um, imports from Russia. Um, the challenge is that. Uh, some of the countries that 
um, uh, that continue to receive gas from Russia um, are the ones that have been uh, least eager um, to um, to take uh, um, uh, steps uh, um, against Russia's aggression. So, so it's a, a politically challenging um, um, dynamic um, in the EU. Um, but but so, um, uh, I, I, uh, I, I think just taking the starting point that we can't pay Russia um, as much as we used to for a fraction of the gas, just uh, um, and, and working from there is, is how I would approach it. Yes, thanks so much, Laurie. And uh, just for, uh, again, before we go to the question uh, from Annette, uh, uh, just a uh, quick quick uh, comment of Ole Hustenko, please. What do you, how uh, do you work uh, specifically on a gas embargo and gas, gas price gap sanctions with uh, uh, the with, uh, EU governments? Or if you do, if you could provide some updates uh, on that as well, because people are quite interested in getting understanding of the what ha what's happening around the natural gas as well. Thanks. Uh, so thank you for this question. Our position is very straightforward. Uh, we want to limit uh, all possible revenues for Russian government. We do believe that Russians are not reliable uh, source of energy now and will never be again. Uh, so uh, everything is applicable for uh, in, in terms of their energy resources. Uh, so for us, gas is the same picture. I mean, we see and we treat gas the uh, same way we treat uh, their oil production. So for us, we need uh, to introduce the embargo on Russian gas. And actually, we are working on that. Uh, now, uh, so, so 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 basically, we don't we don't see a difference in all the possible worlds. So gas is just a part, a small part of this big uh, story, uh, how they were trying to weaponize uh, the energy resources, how they are trying uh, to get their uh, bloody money uh, for uh, their energy, how this bloody money are used. Uh, to kill our people, to destroy our country. So we have to stop it. And this is very straightforward. We don't see a difference here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Leonidovich. And we have, Annette, would you like to ask your question in voice? Because I saw you putting it in the chat. Thank you so much for being with us. If you do, you just may start and speak. If you don't, I can read your question. What would you prefer? Uh, I don't mind. I can I can pronounce my question as well. I was just wondering. It's it's just a brief question. Uh, if you're saying 100 million um, a day, um, Russia is losing money. I was wondering to which period you are uh, comparing it to, because on the curves um, Laurie presented, I had the impression that yes, income went down from experts, um, but at the same time, it went only like not so much down compared to the pre 24th of February level, from which we had like super high prices from which Russia profited. So I was wondering whether in the long term, you can also say that um, the oil price cap is as effective as you presented. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, the uh, comparison is to the period September, November, the period before uh, the price gap uh, entered into force. There's so many things that have happened in the in the global energy markets. Of course, one of the biggest ones being uh, Russia's manipulation of uh, gas supplies. Um, that uh, it's a long way um, to go uh, to squeezing um, uh, Russia's revenues uh, below what they were let's say before summer 2021. Uh, but so the uh, the perspective from which we look at this is that uh, um, tax revenue to Kremlin is really what's paying um, uh, for the war and paying for everything that, that our friends in Ukraine have to experience. And uh, um, all the other sources of tax revenue um, to the Russian government have gone down because of the sanctions and because of the of the self-inflicted self um, impacts from the war and the mobilization. So they're getting less money out of income taxes, out of sales taxes, out of uh, corporate taxes. And uh, um, and at the same time, they're of course incurring 
uh, major expenses. Um, so uh, they're more reliant than ever on, on fossil fuel revenues, and they need more fossil fuel revenues than they used to before um, to maintain a balanced uh, budget. So, so uh, 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 they are, uh, the Russian budget would have already been in serious deficit in the last months of uh, last year without this extraordinary tax on Gazprom that they had, and it's going to go into deficit now. So anything that we can do to slice off um, the revenue um, from here on uh, will have uh, um, will have an impact on, on Russia's ability um, to wage um, the war. Of course, uh, the, the more uh, we can do, um, the better. But it's uh, in that sense, it's it's a much better picture than um, we had um, six months ago when when uh, Russia was basically uh, swimming in money. And uh, if if uh, we're successful in uh, in implementing and ratcheting up these policies, it should also have an impact, for example, on the exchange rate uh, of the ruble which then uh, um, uh, means that uh, uh, Russia's ability to pay for the imports and the shadow, expensive shadow imports and, and so on uh, would be weakened um, as well. So um, it's, uh, there's a lot more to do, but uh, the, the situation is good in the sense that, uh, that uh, if we are able to do more, it will, it will really um, have an impact. Yes, thanks so much. And we will take another five minutes to ask one question to Oleg and to Mai. And after that, we will wrap up, uh, wrap up and we'll, we'll be able to send a follow up with the recording to, to everyone who registered, as we said. Oleg, question to you. Uh, why embargo is so important, not just to end the war? I mean, overall embargo on Russian fossil fuels and cutting Russia completely and permanently from all energy markets. Why it's especially important for renewable energy transition, for clean energy transition, and how this could boost such a transition and a green rebuilding of Ukraine? This is question to you. And later I will ask my as well a question on enforcement. Yeah, actually, this is a very good point, and uh, this was uh, uh, highlighted uh, back uh, in April last year that actually we are the, at the turning point for uh, global climate, and we are like insanely close to the tipping points of the uh, climate and uh, environmental uh, sustainability of the biosphere. And uh, the um, UNEP, uh, United Nations Environment Program, assesses that uh, to start real climate action, uh, fossil fuel production globally should decline at least 6% a year uh, in this decade. And uh, only by really uh, uh, killing the Russian fossil fuel industry we can match this rate of uh, uh, the needed uh, cut in carbon flows uh, into the atmosphere th that are produced by the fossil fuel industry. And, and what is really important about embargo that uh, embargo actually uh, is, uh, is uh, a firewall against uh, Russian fossil fuels entering the markets and uh, uh, against the, the corporate investments in uh, production of fossil fuels in Russia, which were uh, insanely high uh, and everyone invested in Russian fossil fuels. Uh, United States, uh, France, Germany, uh, all the big banks, they invested in Russian carbon bombs in production of uh, huge amounts of fossil fuels, which are not compatible with the Paris Agreement and to, with uh, any uh, climate uh, protection. So basically, embargo should be uh, also considered as a climate policy, as a global climate policy to uh, really keep uh, Russian fossil fuels in the ground permanently. Because uh, if we if we want uh, to have a like a, a livable planet, we need to keep uh, uh, most of the uh, 
proven reserves of fossil fuels in the ground. And Russia created the conditions in which it is the first in line to be uh, a, a subject for uh, supply side climate policy and namely uh, taking action to reduce uh, production of fossil fuels. So, and uh, for, for the, the renewables, uh, this is a question now of uh, uh, mobilizing the investments and uh, what was happening like in previous decades is that uh, banks and uh, investors, they were following the, the easy road to do business as usual and to uh, just uh, swamp uh, the, uh, the fossil fuel industry with money, with uh, investment in expansion. And, and this uh, has to uh, end uh, permanently. And uh, all the, the uh, financial institutions, they should commit to real decarbonizations and clean up their portfolios and really uh, uh, end uh, the investments in oil and gas. And Russia is is the first uh, first uh, subject to that, and uh, all the financial institutions and investors who invested in Russian fossil fuel projects should acknowledge that that was a terrible mistake, and uh, to deal with that and to um, uh, uh, divert all the investments in the renewables instead of uh, oil and gas uh, exploration and production. Yes, thanks so much, Alek, and to my on enforcement. You've mentioned this quite a lot, and this is really important how we put the enforcement measures onto governments and industry as well. And um, I wanted to ask you one question also popped up uh, here from the social media while we are posting the outcomes. Um, are the EU liability measures um, effective that they imposed on uh, those who are trying to break or avoid sanctions or uh, are they still effective and efficient, or some other or some other measures are still needed to push for really closing all loopholes in the sanctions and putting enough of enforcement onto those who are breaking the regulation and sanctions regime? Thank you for that question, Svetlana. It's a it's a good one because uh, one point that I made before and that we've been making over and over again is that. Uh, without enforcement, all of these laws are just words on paper. And, uh, you know, because they're so important and because so much time and resources and effort has been sunk into creating them, we need to show, make sure that that second half of the puzzle, the enforcement side, is there. When it comes to the EU's enforcement capabilities, um, they are really not fit for purpose. Um, the EU, the way that sanctions enforcement works is that they delegate uh, authority to enforce to the 27 member states, which means that there's this really uneven patchwork of resources and capability and political will to enforce sanctions um, between member states. There's also not uniform penalties in many European countries um, sanctions violations aren't even considered a criminal offense. They're considered an administrative violation, um, which is not really a big deterrent for anyone who is interested, you know, is skirting the line um, or operating in a gray zone, knowing that, you know, some small administrative fine may be found against them is not a sufficient deterrent. Um, there is also the issue of resourcing, as I mentioned, that there's, you know, only at the highest level of the EU, at the oversight level, there's only, you know, about 24 people uh, overseeing some 40 sanctions regimes. So unlike the US, which has OFAC, which is, you know, a centralized um, government agency that does investigate and oversee um, sanctions violations, the EU has a very poor record of sanctions enforcement. Um, and in order to correct that, they need to massively invest in some kind of centralized authority to oversee these sanctions, to monitor them, so that it's not up to uh, Korea and Razom and Global Witness to, you know, hold these companies to account. Um, we, they need to increase the penalties 
for sanctions violations, and they also need to standardize them across the jurisdictions. So it's not that, you know, if you make a sanctions violation in, in one EU member state, there's very little or no penalty, and in another, there is a penalty. Um, so they need to invest, and then they need to increase, uh, yeah, the penalty, and they need to properly oversee um, these regimes. Um, otherwise, all of that you know, effort and work that went into creating these rules that are so critical um, to choking off Russia's revenues um, are not worth the paper that they're written on. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, my um, Oleg uh, Leonidovich and Oleg and uh, also Lori for this uh, really interesting and profound data that you've shared with us today and numbers and your opinions. It's very valuable. Uh, we all we need to do everything we can uh, to finally end fossil fuel addictions that feeds Russian's war machine and uh, to, to win over Putin and Russia and on their fossil fuels, which will lead us to, to renewable energy revolution. And thank you so much, Oleg Ustenko, for pointing that out, that we still have hope. We have we have envisioned the better future and the centralized energy systems that benefit all people, but not based on the blood fossil fuel revenues of dictators. Uh, thank you very much for our uh, to our partners, Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air, Global Witness, Razum We Stand, and also Presidential Office and Oleho Stenko in person for being with us today. And we will keep you updated. Please join our social media and uh, social media channels and follow us in LinkedIn and Twitter and in the Facebook. We will keep you involved and we will keep you updated. Thank you so much for today. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.